Irish Pages is a Belfast journal combining Irish, European, and international perspectives. It seeks to create a novel literary space in the North adequate to the unfolding cultural potential of the new political dispensation. The magazine is cognizant of the need to reflect in its pages the various mesh levels of human relations. The regional, Ulster. The national, Britain and Ireland. The continental, the whole of Europe and the globe. So Belfast was one of 12 cities in the United Kingdom bidding for UK capital of culture. And because of the civic, cultural, and economic importance of this designation, um, there was a good deal of money about for the bid. Uh, there was a team organizing it, and the way it worked was 12 people came around to all uh, 12 cities and looked at the bid. Um, at that point, I realized that, that despite the huge literary tradition in the North since the 60s, Eni Longley et al., Derek Maher, and so forth, uh, there was really no true literary journal. There was something called Fortnite. It did have poems, it did have reviews, but it was more of a political journal. Uh, there, therefore, I went to the office which was organizing um, imagine Belfast bid. Um, there was a very nice woman named Patricia Hunter, and they had considerable latitude about just making decisions on the spot. And I made a pitch to Patricia, who subsequently died very sadly, young, and um, said that I could throw together a very good literary journal in time for the formal opening of the bid. And she thought about it a while, and she gave us, because of Cahill O'Sharkey was already involved at that stage, um, 1,500 pounds for the first two issues. So that got us off. Um, the thing about literary journals is that no one really believes in them until they see the actual output, the actual so-called product, the actual finished uh, item. And I think uh, the first two issues immediately established us as um, a journal with the highest content and really fine production values. To be a successful literary journal, rather than just a journal that's printed and handed out to fellow writers or fellow co-conspirators, um, you know, you really have to work. It's, it's a real job. Uh, and so that soon became clear. Um, and um, the fantasy morphed into more like the dedicated work of what T.S. Eliot called being, quote, a servant of literature, because that's what an editor is. You know, an editor serves other writers. Obviously, he expresses his taste, he has to make judgments, but fundamentally, an editor, a good editor anyway, is a person who serves other writers, writings, writing in general, and I suppose the culture in general. I, um, my purpose, I think, is fundamentally ethical. I want to make a slightly different kind of journal um, that is both, contains both writing of the highest artistic consciousness, but at the same time in the thick of the contemporary world and its dilemmas. That said, we don't have any particular agenda. We'll, we'll publish anything that's good. But that's a general tendency of the ethos. We slowly become overwhelmed by the mass media, by dumbing down, by great power politics, etc. And what above all is needed is an ethical chorus in the classical sense. The chorus was not part of the action in the Greek drama, but it warned the players about the consequences of their action, about the correct course that they should take. They, the chorus, in fact, functioned as elders do in tribal societies. And somehow, we need to reinstate a chorus comprised of all different kinds of organizations, including literary journals, theater companies, 
arts organizations, human rights uh, activists, um, gender equality act uh, activists, um, NGOs, all those people are not part of the action, not directly on the stage of Northern Ireland, the province, whatever you want to call it, the north, the north of Ireland, was coming up for air, basically, after the Troubles. It's 2002, the Assembly's not fully operational, the Belfast Agreement is in place, and above all, we needed cultural initiatives to change the place. The political issues had been formally solved. The communal issues obviously still have not been solved. So there was a general feeling of coming up for air after the Troubles in 2002, when I made the bid to imagine Belfast and when the journal started. That phrase, coming up for air, of course, is uh, one of the titles of Orwell's novel. And it always reminds me of something, I think Seamus Heaney said that, you know, a few of the cultural initiatives during the Troubles, like the Linen Hall Library and other uh, field day and so forth, were like breathing holes in the ice that had formed over the society. So my idea was that Irish pages would become a major cultural breathing hole to break up, let us say, the political, cultural, social ice that had formed during the Troubles. And that's effectively what the whole society has been doing since 1998, the Belfast Agreement. It's frozen over from time to time, but basically the ice, the spiritual ice, to use an image of Kafka, that formed over this place, created a kind of autarky or isolated zone, has been breaking up since the Belfast Agreement. I'm also proud because we have two new editors who have joined from Scotland. Part of our plan to make this as much a Irish as a British or Scottish journal. They are the very distinguished poet and essayist Kathleen Jamie and uh, the new uh, Scottish Gaelic editor Meg Bateman. The mistake of previous northern journals is to be bound by the very insularity and regionalism and borders of this state that emerged from partition. So at the same time we're very conscious of being an all-Ireland journal. The other editor is in the other jurisdiction, um, the Republic, and we're funded by both Arts Council. So we're also an all-Ireland all journal. But we're at the same time, um, you know, we don't have a problem with accepting that we're uh, a British journal, too. I mean, this is part of the flexibility that we want to have. When I said the national in the credo just there, some people might have noticed that the first one I mentioned was Britain, Britain and Ireland. Well, that's the technical constitutional propriety, but many people feel they're also in Ireland. So the national, we, we balance. We don't have a problem saying that we're an Irish journal, a British journal, Irish-British journal. Those kinds of um, issues of terminology are really the issues of the people who raise them. At the same time, we want to be an international journal in the sense of a European global, or global journal. So we're very cognizant in all the way we balance the writing that we're moving from our place here in Belfast, in the north, in Ireland, to a more international and global perspective. And that is why in every issue, about half of the work is from Ireland and the other half is from overseas. Three words, a Yeatsian project, a Yeatsian project. That does have certain political overtones, but remember, Yeats's project was really fundamentally cultural renewal, which did lead to political change. He was fundamentally a writer. Writing came first. But his project did change Ireland, and it did have a connection with Irish independence, obviously. So I see it as a Yeatsian project, not in a narrow way, and not just confined to the north, but a project of ethical, of the ethical amount. In short, apropos keeping it print and not putting any content online except a few extracts, I do believe we made the right choice for a variety of reasons. I, the material culture of print will survive, that it will remain far into the future a, a good economic proposition, 
that is also a service to posterity and so forth. Um, I just noticed as we were um, filming that there is a phrase on the cover of the TOS as follows, the malign divinity of tech. Yes, exactly. But we're not, uh, I suppose we're, we're becoming iconoclasts to the, the malign divinity of tech by sticking to print. And I think in the end it's a good choice. And it's a profitable choice in the sense that there are many people out there who like well-produced books of high quality. Obviously, a journal like Irish Pages is the absolute antithesis of fake news. So in that sense, it's, it's immediately relevant, even if the readership is small. <clears throat> is small. Because dissident thinking and dissident writing and dissident experience we know are important from you know the Soviet communist experience in Eastern Europe in the long term. Of course uh, uh, fake news, media sensationalism, sensationalism all of all sorts, simplification of all sorts, lack of lack of rich inheritance of all sorts, stupidity of all sorts, or more or less ant antithetical to what we're trying to do in Irish Pages. Why? Because meaning takes time. Meaning takes skill. Deliberation. So we give space, time and space and a place for the non-simplification, the non-fake news, the non-media tabloid sensationalism, the non-populist. That is one of our that has become one of our purposes. One of the real proxy strengths of Irish Pages is actually the very standing and achievement of Irish writing itself. I mean, that standing and that achievement precedes, as it were, the reception of the journal and has done a lot for us vis-a-vis -vis overseas appreciation, marketing, and so forth. Um, this moment actually appears in an essay of mine called Troubled Belfast, and I think it's perhaps just worth reading. Not so long ago, I was thinking about what a young poet had said to me earlier from a sofa in my office. Ireland, you know, is a literary superpower. I had paused a moment before I agreed, ticking off in my mind a first quick roster of distinction. Shaw, Yeats, O'Casey, Beckett, Bowen, Heaney, Butler, Tobin, before trailing off into many others. It's something of a mystery, we concluded weakly, adjourning till the next reprise of the theme, that such a small culture had produced such literary magnificence over the past century. And then I continued to discuss how my feeling for that Ireland has always been a kind of gigantic microcosm of the wider world, and perhaps the very smallness of Ireland, the island culture, has created a kind of a contained space where people colliding or working off each other proves to be a kind of catalyst. And also, you know, metropolitan cultures like London or New York, where I grew up, or Boston, where I was educated and so forth, they tend to condescend to small cultures. But small cultures have energies that are, you know, are, are um, not available to the metropolitan with a map. My phrase for this is um, small size, big space. You know, Ireland, the north even, is very small, but there's all sorts of stuff in it. It's rich in culture. Probably the main big challenge and excitement of the past year is that we have now started a cognate or associated press called the Irish Pages Press. The journal has paved the way in terms of distribution and awareness for a good press. And uh, it's time passed to have a really fine uh, literary press based in the north, but in all Ireland in perspective, indeed global and international perspective. So that, that's the aim, and we're just at the beginning of that um, new road, you might say, that parallels the journal. One of the real pleasures of editing is to meet people, to meet fine writers, great literary writers to talk to them, to understand how their imaginative psychodynamics function. It's been a real honor to make friends with some fine writers and photographers in the course of my editorial work. Now, 
I know that there are a lot of critiques about the ability to judge along all sorts of it, uh, lines, gender lines, age lines, cultural lines, but I still think the effort to, um, uh, s to establish and publish what is the best in thought and writing is a worthy contribution ultimately to human progress.